Good morning. Good to be with you this morning. I saw your service online last week, so I know that you're expecting me if you were here last week. My name is uh, Pastor Matthew Frankie. I currently serve, uh, and for the last 30 years have served uh, as an Air Force officer, 25 of those years as an Air Force chaplain, currently stationed here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base as the command chaplain for Air Force Materiel Command and its 89,000 personnel. But that means I don't have a pulpit. I'm kind of like a Kind of like a district president is probably the closest thing in the Missouri Synod uh, to what I do. Only I'm kind of like the English district or the Selk, the Slovak Evangelical Lutheran Church. <laughs> that Because uh, my people, 145 of them, go from uh, Boston to Fort Walton Beach, Florida, to uh, the deserts of California and around the world. And so I don't have a, a geographic district like Ohio. But that means uh, I don't have a pulpit every Sunday morning, and I get to be with you today, and Pastor Tony, can, uh, he can take a vacation and get away for a little bit. So it is good to be with you. Are there any, any announcements uh, that need to be made? Seeing none, uh, we also have a guest uh, person on the keyboard, so uh, Ms. Roseanne Brown is up there, uh, and, and it's, what a good pleasure for me because uh, she is my daughter's was my daughter's high school choir teacher uh, at Dominion Academy in downtown Dayton. And so uh, when pastor sent out the bulletin or when the secretary sent out the bulletin, we suddenly discovered that uh, we'll be uh, having a short reunion this morning. But it is good to be with you both. We begin with our, our printed psalmody from Psalm 85, uh, reading responsibly. Uh, the congregation reading those portions in the bold print. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield to Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. We join in singing our opening hymn, hymn number 686, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
This morning we follow the order of service in divine service setting three. Uh, without communion this morning, with pastor being gone, but I invite you to rise, Divine Service 3 on page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, O Lord, sinful thee. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to each of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with the glory. Heavenly Father, although we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all of our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're seated for the readings. Good morning. The Old Testament reading is from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 to 15. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, guys. Hey, I am going to just have you stand right there for a moment in that. Do you remember at the company picnic that you guys came to with mom and dad at my, my company and stuff, and you guys were playing Jenga? Do you remember that? Nope. <laughs> yeah, that was at least a month ago. Okay, you know Jenga, right? Where you take, you build up those walls and you pull stuff out. What do you want to do is you want to make sure everything is straight so that you have a solid foundation and the walls stand, right? And stuff. So the thing is, there was a plumb line. Ms. Linda, she was talking up from the Old Testament and about a plumb line. I don't think you even know what a plumb line is, do you? No. Plumb line makes sure that something's straight. So you get it straight. And that's what we're going to kind of do right now. I'm going to see if you can hold this straight. Lucy, I want you to come right here. Or maybe, Amelia, why don't you come right here? Okay, can you come behind me? And I want to see if you can hold this straight. Okay, come, come back here and hold that straight, okay? Now, let's see, do you think that's straight? Not quite. Let's turn this on and... 
Can, can, you, can you make it straight from that? Kind of, right? That gives you an orientation. See how this line is straight up and down? Now, the thing is, what we want to do is just get it just right, like right about like that, right? Now, the people of God, this is, now, now Amos steps in. Amos came to the people of Israel. You guys are the people of Israel, and he's telling you how to live a straight life. But you know what you did? He said, get away, Amos! Get out of here! We don't want you. Uh-oh. Now what happens? Yeah, you don't even want this guy. Just, do you know, can you hold this straight? Do you know what straight is? Yeah, it's number like a number one. It needs to be straight, but do you have any help? You need, you need the word of God to come back. The thing is, God's people at that time, the tribes of Israel, they said, we don't want it. And Amos left with that word of God. Notice he took the, what's this? Uh, you know, that's the Bible, the word of God. He took the word of God with him, and those people didn't have any guidance. They didn't care. They wanted to live their own lives, and God ended up punishing them. I don't know if you heard what he he said, is that Rehoboam, the house would die, and ended up that Jeroboam's, or Rehoboam's son, son, Zechariah, I think, was, was killed when the Assyrians came in. And then the people went off in exile, and they were lost. Now, that, that's what I want you to do, is kind of hold that as straight as you can. Now, we have a pastor come in, who's, every week, he's here to us, showing us this word of God. And our goal is right Let's see if we can get this perfectly straight. We're reminded, can you, can you hold on to that? And see if you can get that straight right in the middle. Let's go down right about there. Can we kind of do that? Yeah. Yeah, we kind of can do that. Can we hold it perfectly like that? We can try, right? Pastor's helping us with this word of God. He's showing us how to live a good life. And the thing is, we get pretty close, right? But we're not perfect. And so when we start every... Okay, and so when we start every day, like every service, we start with the forgiveness of sins, right? Pastor tells us, and we remember that we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what he does is he points us in the right way. And what do you see? What's that in the shape of? Amelia, what, what would you say? What's that the shape of? What's the red line forming? What's that forming? A cross, that's right. He's pointing us to Jesus and the forgiveness there. And that is red. What color is it? Red. red. And red reminds us of Jesus' blood. blood. That's right, his blood, that he died in our place. And his perfection was given us, his straightness. And because of that perfection, we can live with him forevermore. So we're a little bit sometimes like this when we go through our week. We never want to say, get out of here, Pastor. We don't want to hear this word of God anymore. We want him to remind us. That's what his office. He teaches us. Here's what you guys have done. He pre preaches the law to us, which we don't always like to hear. That means we've fallen short of his glory. But then he points us to Jesus. The forgiveness is ours and his perfection in him. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious message of the gospel. And Lord, we thank you that even though sometimes when we want to chase you out of our lives, we do wrong things, that pastors are here for us to call us back, us back to you. We thank you for that law that shows us our sin, and more importantly, for that gospel that points us to Jesus and his love. We thank you for that cross, and we ask that your spirit, that seal given us in baptism, would help us to follow you all our days until one day we're reunited with heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, guys, let's go. Let's go with Grandma. We rise for the Alleluia verse and the reading of the Holy Gospel. Alleluia. According to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory be to thee, o Lord. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become, become known. 
Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why these miracles, miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask for me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. She went outside and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oath and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to We join in confessing the, our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Proceeded for our sermon hymn, hymn number 539, Christ is the World's Redeemer.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. People God dearly loves. I don't know how many folks here are in the military or maybe have been in the military. A few hands out there. We have this thing in the military called a promotion system. So if you do well with the responsibilities that are given to you, that you might actually be promoted. There's actually a board for the Air Force that meets in San Antonio uh, for different, uh, different groups. So when their chaplains uh, have a promotion coming up, then there's a promotion board that meets. And they go through a list of those who are eligible. It's their time in their career to be looked at and evaluated. They score their records. And then at the end of that, they make a selection and say, okay, we're going to promote these individuals. And that doesn't get, mean that you get promoted right away. It means that you are selected for promotion. And, and that list doesn't come out usually until about four or five months after the board meets. It has to go through all kinds of approval processes and, and vetting. And then you finally it's announced, and then you still might wait for a while before you actually put on that rank for that promotion. So by the Lord's blessings, um, I've been promoted a few times. There were times that I was not promoted. I know what that feels like. But I got promoted eventually to the rank of colonel. And the next step above that is brigadier general. And we've only got one of those in the Air Force Chaplain Corps, and he's the deputy to the chief of chaplains, and then above him is one two-star general, and he is the chief, of, he or she, uh, is the chief of chaplains. We have had female chiefs of chaplains in the past as well. So I've met a few promotion boards since I pinned on colonel. The first few didn't really count. You know, if you're the new guy on the block, your chances aren't very, very significant. But the last few, well, in 2021, there was a promotion board, and I was a contender, I suppose, but the results finally came out after months of waiting and it went to someone else. But then there was another one in 2023 and then I knew I was a contender and I saw what my commanding officer put on my report. And it went in and I thought, you know, I, there's a shot at this. But the results came out, and my name wasn't the result. It was a good colleague and friend of mine, Chaplain Trent Davis, who's now the Brigadier General. But then the Chief of Chaplains said that he's going to retire, and he actually retires a month from now on August the 9th is his ceremony, and I'll be in D.C. for that because he was once my boss and a supervisor. And so there was another promotion board in 2023. And I'll just tell you, a little secret, and that is that I am destined for greatness. And uh, that's, that's right. It might be kind of shocking to hear from a pastor, from a preacher who's supposed to be a humble servant, but the truth is the truth. You can't varnish it too much. And I'm destined for greatness. And so are you. Uh, every last one of you. Uh, we are destined for greatness. In fact, I might go a bit further to say that this greatness that you and I are destined for has already happened. Uh, we're in that situation now. Sometimes it's kind of like waiting for that promotion board to come out. You don't know if you've been promoted or not, right? You're waiting to make plans. Should we buy a house? Should we retire? You don't know. Your name could come up on the list, but, but know that you are destined for greatness. And I didn't come across this greatness recipe. It wasn't something I found, a 12-step you know, method on the Internet for greatness and success. It, I didn't find it in the self-help section of the Barnes and Noble. There's plenty of things there to make you better or maybe even great. But I found it actually in this very ancient old letter that was tucked away in the middle of an old book with a bunch of other letters that you probably have in your house. I pray that you have it in your house. It's called the Bible. And in the Bible, I discovered that I am indeed destined for greatness, or should I say that I have been and am destined, and that... So are you. And if that sounds promising, it should, but it gets even better. You see, this destiny, this greatness that you and I have, it was not self-achieved. There's some good news here, because some of you may be thinking, I haven't done a whole lot that's great in my life, and maybe you have more than you know. But the fact is that you and I, it has nothing to do with us, but it has to do with all the greatness and the glory of God. St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in these early verses of the letter, to his letter to Ephesus. 
He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's it, right there. That's where the discovery uh, was made. The first few verses of the book of Ephesians that were our epistle lesson just a few moments ago. It tells us about this destiny that has been given to you, that you and I now have, and it is it basically says that some really great stuff. It says that we are great. We're great because God chose us, not because of what we did. And before I go any further, I just want to make clear that our greatness is not, it's not the way the world looks at it, not in the worldly sense. So, you see, greatness doesn't involve your accomplishments, whether they be in school, whether you were magna cum laude or not, or what your degree was, or if you finished your degree. It doesn't involve your sports accomplishments, even though you may have a trophy or two that you still hang on to, or your music, or your careers, and your promotions from a promotion board, your family, your politics. It doesn't involve any of those things. Our greatness has nothing to do with the world's definition of greatness, but everything to do with God and his greatness. As I said, it's something that's already happened to you and to me. That God has made us great because it says he chose us. He chose us to be his own. He chose us to be a part of his family. A little bit more about this greatness thing. Even in a world that may be full of confident and maybe seemingly and sometimes truly arrogant people, which sometimes we ourselves might be, it isn't always easy to think of yourself as great. This morning, I, we just came back 48 hours ago. I was Paul Bearer at my, do, my cousin's funeral in, uh, in southeast Missouri, but uh, I stack a mail uh, on the counter when I came in, and I'm always the first one up in the house, and I look to see through with the mail, and there was an alumni, uh, alumni magazine, right? And I've graduated from a few different universities, and my daughter is now in college, and it was from her school, and I just flipped through it, and it's like, wow, you know, how many books has she published, and what scientific discoveries has he made, and what political office has he attained, and all these great stories of success of alumni from that particular institution. But it seems that no matter what your level of self-esteem is, it's easy for me, and I would suspect sometimes easy for you, to feel insignificant and unimportant especially when you're reading an alumni magazine and you hear all your classmates that are doing seemingly great things. In a highly advanced world, highly sophisticated world of advanced degrees and computer technology and perfect bodies and lots of money and other various methods that we deem as people being successful, it's easy, very easy, to feel anything but great. There will always be someone who is seemingly smarter, seemingly richer, better looking, more handsome, more beautiful, more accomplishments, more successful than you. The way the world evaluates success. There's always going to be somebody who's greater. So much so that there are times that we may question our worth and our value, especially in moments of discouragement, when life gets us down, perhaps when we're comparing ourselves to others around us or people that we know or maybe even people we don't know that we really don't need to be worried about and concerned about. But our doubt and our importance in the whole scheme of things, we can doubt that. And it's then and especially then that we need to be reminded of our greatness in God's eyes. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in those first verses, we hear this amazingly tremendous doxology of praise. 
where Paul says, and he calls us to remember that we are great because God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ, that we are great because the Lord has done great things for us. Let me read a little bit more from there, verses 4 through 10. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his promise, which he set forth in Christ." as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and on things on earth. So it's amazing that he chose us, but even almost incomprehensible that he chose us before the creation of the world, is what Paul says. In other words, we weren't just an afterthought, right? I have a ceremony coming up, I'm sending out invitations, and it's like, oh, I didn't invite them, I probably should send an invitation. No, we were in the original plans. And if you're an architect, there's a charrette, there's a design that's there, and we were in that. We're significant in God. We are significant in God's eyes and important to him because he chose us. And again, it's not because it's anything that we merit in us. It's not because we're so wonderful, because we're so worthy. We read from the prophet Amos today and talking about how the children of Israel had fallen and people who they were never worthy and wonderful to begin with, but God chose them and loved them in his mercy and in his grace. And so he does for us. You know, if our, if our being great and being destined for greatness was up to us, we'd be nothing. In fact, but his love, he chose us and he says he adopted us to be his children. And all this talk about destiny is actually, there's actually, the better word is predestination. That's the word that Paul uses, and that's the word that's used in Ephesians. And it can be quite confusing. And I'll be honest with you, it has sparked a lot of debate. You could fill this room with the books that have been written by theologians about predestination and how that could be. And some have reasoned that if God chose some to be his children and that if he chose for some people to go to heaven, then he must have chosen other people not to be his children and other people not to go to heaven. But the problem with that is that I can find no place in Scripture where God chooses or desires anyone to be lost forever in hell. It's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And I think part of this confusion on predestination is also that we have these finite minds. I don't know about you, but it is hard for me to remember what day I'm in. Being off of work and traveling and having a funeral on a Friday and traveling on a Saturday, my whole week was messed up. I didn't know what day it was. And even though God created time, even though he put the earth in orbit around the sun and the, and the moon in orbit around the earth and he created years and months and days, he's not bound by those. You and I live on a 24-hour clock and I tell you, if my 20, 2002 Tahoe digital clock is not lined up with Apple time, which is actually the, the GPS time, which is maintained by the Air Force, you're, you're welcome. Um, that's how your gas pumps, your banks, everything work, the Air Force maintains that for you and for the country and for the world. Um, you know, I, I, I'm out of sync. Am I early? Am I late? But God isn't bound by time. You know, we, we find it hard to even live in the present sometimes. And, and we don't remember the past. My wife keeps remembering things that I don't remember, but she seems to. Or we wonder about the future and what that's going to bring. But God has this amazing ability, I suppose, that if he can see the the past with great accuracy, know everything that's going on in the present, and know the future all at the same time. So no wonder it's confusing that we don't fully understand this selection process, this 
destination or predestination. But the bottom line is, is we rejoice in the result. We rejoice in the fact that we've been chosen. We have been adopted by God. I don't know if any of you are adopted, I, and I'm not, but I have friends who are, and I have family members who are. And those who are old enough to remember the adoption, being in the courtrooms at the most significant day of their life, other than becoming a Christian, to say that there was a parent, an adult, that looked out and said, I choose you to be my child. You don't have to go in and out of foster homes anymore. You don't have to worry about the future anymore. You're my child. I love you no matter what. That's what God's done for us. And he says that in this adoption, he does even more than that, more than we could ever dream. He says that he makes us holy and blameless. As I was looking through my sermon on my balcony this morning in the apartment where we're living right now, uh, house number 21 uh, in 36 years of marriage, <laughs> I, I, uh, I was looking through there and I thought, how many people does the Bible say were holy and blameless? Enoch walked with God. If you read the first chapter of Job, uh, the Bible says that Job was a man who was blameless and righteous before God. But there aren't many. And yet he says that God has made you and me holy and blameless in Christ. And he's even made known to us this plan of salvation. He's, he's revealed it. You know, that's the difference between Christianity and so many other religions where people have to wonder, who is God? What is he like? Am I good enough? Am, am I not good enough? God's laid out a plan of salvation, and oh, by the way, he gives you the playbook. He says, yes, you are holy enough. And sometimes when we come and we think to ourselves that we're not significant, that we're not worthy enough, we need to be reminded of the cost that he paid, that the blood of Christ that redeems us and makes us his. Sometimes if you feel like you're not significant, if you're not worthy, remember the lengths that God made to make you his own. Let me read on the last few verses from verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we were who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You know, there's still more. On the top of the fact that God chose us and adopted us, on the top of the fact that he did it before the, before the foundation of the world, he also gives us the game plan. Here's, here's how much I love you, and here's how this all happened in Christ. And oh, by the way, he also sends his Holy Spirit as a seal, a deposit guaranteeing our destiny. When that promotion list comes out in the military, there's a phrase that says, happiness is a line number, okay? You're not promoted yet, but you have a number, and it might be, you know, 1,216, which means you're getting promoted 10 months from now when you actually get to put that rank on. But that's okay. <laughs> you're happy because you know your destiny. Paul says, we know our destiny, and the Holy Spirit is makes that deposit, makes that seal on us, kind of like that line number that you have, that you know that good things are coming and have already happened to you as a child of God. And the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, the presence of faith in your life is a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. And it motivates and it moves us to live for the praise and the glory of God. Well, to say with Paul Harvey the rest of the story, um, I've told you we've moved. We're in an apartment now. I told you there was a promotion board and there's a ceremony coming up. But I didn't get promoted. Um, that was a very good friend and a very deserving chaplain, Chaplain Dave Kelly, a fine Christian, uh, who I have full confidence in both him and Chaplain Trent Davis as they move in to take leadership of the United States Air Force Chaplain Corps. In the ceremony, that's my retirement, <laughs> because once you hit 30 years as a colonel, they say, you can't do this anymore. We're kicking you out. I think I probably would stay and do it longer if they didn't say, you've reached your max. 
But it's easy sometimes. It's easy when you don't get an assignment, when you don't get a promotion, when you don't get the award, when you don't get the recognition. Sometimes in our human weakness, we can feel inferior. And it's so easy and so human nature to compare ourselves to others around us in terms of worldly accomplishments, in terms of worldly acclaim. And yet when we consider our spiritual blessings, every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms, we can't, be, can't help but be overwhelmed by our standing in God's eyes. We can't help but be overwhelmed that he loves us that much. We can't help but be overwhelmed that he destined me and he destined you, each of you, for greatness. It's yours now. You've got the line number. You're living in it. But the best is yet to come. Because he chose us, as Paul says, to be holy and blameless in his sight. To him be the glory to the Father, the Son, and our Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. We rise for the offertory created in me. seated as we receive the offer. We continue with the prayers of the church. Uh, we will include prayers for those who are listed in the bulletin uh, by name and then also with the Lord's Prayer uh, before the, the benediction and, and then finally the final hymn. Uh, we rise for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, that the Lord would preserve her for his name's sake and answer her in his righteousness and faithfulness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the testimony of Christ's word opposed by the world and for conviction and confidence in our confession that salvation is found through Jesus Christ alone, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all ministers, that God would make them zealous and faithful in their service for Matthew, our synodical president, Kevin, our district president, and Herb, our circuit visitor, that God would grant them wisdom in their work and joy in their calling. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the blessed estate of marriage, 
that God would cause chastity to be prized among his Christians and honored also in the world. For husbands and wives, that God would bind them together in love and forgiveness. And for parents, that God would equip them by his spirit with every good gift to care for and teach the children he gives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our nation and its leaders, that God would spare them, especially in light of yesterday's violence. We pray for our civil servants and our people that their conduct would be wise, just, and honorable in accord with the Lord's revealed will. And even for those who oppose God, that the Lord would be merciful to them for the sake of Christ and remember that he desires all to be saved. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the needy in body and soul, especially Dave, Wayne and Gail, Helen and Mindy, Jean, Rosemary, Pam, Charlotte, Barbara and Tracy, Hetty Siegel's son, Saad, Laverne, Jack, Sarah, Grace, and those we name in our hearts at this time. That he would lavish the riches of his grace on them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we would respect the bodies of the saints in life and in death. And that as the disciples of John gave him a proper burial, we too would confess our expectation of the resurrection in word and deed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, join these, our prayers and praises, with those of your faithful people in every time and in every place. Unite them in the ceaseless petitions of our great High Priest until he comes again on the last day. For to you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our service concludes on page 202 with a benediction. Before that, just one announcement. There is Bible class today. Uh, we'll be doing a video lesson on uh, next week is Good Shepherd Sunday. And not to steal any of pastor's uh, fodder for Bible class, but uh, probably some things and some insights about shepherding in the Middle East and in the Israelites' day that, uh, that I didn't know for many, many years. And, and I think something you might enjoy learning as well. So I'd invite you to Bible class at 1030. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his favor upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Closing hymn, hymn number 819, a wonderful doxological hymn. Sing praise to God, the highest good.